issues in Hong Kong, how best or what else can we do to raise awareness so that, for example, when Mr. Lam goes to schools again to talk about water conservation, it's not that hard. People are students and in particular, they are already tuned, okay, I need to save water and not that wasteful. Panel members, do you have any ideas what else can we do to raise awareness, to make a connection, whether it's globally, regionally, nationally, and even locally in Hong Kong? What else can we do? Because it's a really important issue. Time is running out. Okay, I'll, I'll make the first attempt. <laughs> um, I think was, um, you mentioned earlier, um, Smart, that um, uh, people have an aversion to drinking pee. Right, uh, your, our own waste. So, just very quickly, how many people on, in this room have would object to that? Everyone would, would be happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, after treatment. Um, but I think I think you know people have a mental block, right? But I, I often ask people, you know, if you do have a mental block against this, how many of you, how many people from Hong Kong do you think go to Singapore? Right, and I'll probably say probably quite a lot of the population go there for holiday. If you're holidaying in Singapore, you're definitely drinking your own pee. Right. So, so we should actually just get past this mental block, and maybe maybe that should be the campaign. If you go to Singapore, you're doing that. So why not do it at home anyway? <laughs> Maybe not so innovative. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I come back to the tariff uh, story, and uh, I think uh, I mean changing behaviors and, and communicating. It's I know everything is very important on every stage, on the school stage, on, uh, at every stage. But in the end, it comes to money, and and we we experienced also in Switzerland that. That the, the strongest effects you have, if you have to pay for something, then you, the, the value will increase and you, you start saving it. So I think uh, we, we had a statement before from Mr. Ma, and I think it's very important for the political process here to, to raise this uh, issue again. And as you said, it's not for, for, for uh, enhan enhancing the, the, the government money, it's, it's, it, you have to bring. Uh, good reason why you you want to uh, increase the tariffs, no? And and I think there's a lot of reasons why you should do that. When I hear to the, all these statements, uh, it's a very complex situation where Hong Kong is in today, and and I think there's many reasons why how to to uh, justify to to increase tariffs, and I think uh, to me this this process has to be uh, enhanced in the future. Um. I just want to add on Deborah's comment on going to Singapore, you're definitely going to drink your own <laughs> discharge. Uh, good news is not really, <laughs> because I did the research on that. Only very, very small amount of the treated effluent is injected into the water reservoir. Very minimal. Majority of the treated water in Singapore is actually used for the high tech, and that requires a very pure water. And they made that as an economic rose niche. This is the goodness of Singapore practice. Not only they can resolve the water resources issue, but also make it another opportunity to develop and to have attracted high qualification uh, experts from all over the world. And this is somewhere Hong Kong is in the position we could try to become a China water hub. Why not? We have a lot of practice that's pioneered, like our drainage and water is separate system from a century ago. Like we have all kinds of stage of wastewater treatment facilities, from the very primary to the very advanced. And we have the knowledge and the te technology to support. We could do more contribution to overall China's water pollution battle. So this is something we could learn from. Uh, I've got one proposal, whether it is practical or not. Uh, practice uh, water rationing, four hours per four days. Just choose one week, okay, each year. Uh, perhaps we can use the winter season <laughs> for hygiene reasons. Then we just have four hours per four days. Let's see how it goes. Singapore is doing this, actually. From time to time, they will do the water rationing, they call it the rehearsal. 
from the district, just one district, without a notification, cut off the water for eight hours. And then in another few months, another district. So this constantly reminding Singapore they are a water scarce state. If they want to stay strong, not to kneel down to any kind of power, politically, economically, whatever, they would have to be self-resilient. So, yeah. Yeah, actually I, I, I was living in Singapore when they actually introduced new water and even though there was a small amount of discharge, of course the Singaporeans were really up in arms about this, right? You know, because who wants this waste in their water, even though it's just tiny, right? And, and they did a huge campaign, the Prime Minister had to come out and sort of say, I'm drinking this water, it's safe, you know, and, I, and there's public images of him guzzling this thing down. Um, but it took them a long time to, to get there, right? Um, but I think you know it's a journey that we all in a, in an increasingly water scarce world. I think it's uh, especially in the region. It's a journey that we we, we have to take and invest in these uh, educational campaigns and, and so on to get us there. Uh, tariff, I think, is a is a great thing. I, I think I pay something like uh, forty dollars every three months in my water bill, and I, I think that's a big user already. I pay um, forty dollars every day for two coffees. Right, and so, so I think if I had to pay $40 a day for my water, I'm sure I'm going to only practice water rationing many times a day. <laughs> Before I ask the panel members and other questions, I'd like to see if any members in the audience would like to ask questions. Yes, gentlemen. Hi, uh, actually I'd like to, like, um, Propose a really practical solution for me. May I, may I know? Uh, Jimmy, like, uh, from Vitagent. Uh, in addition to what Mr. Lam suggests, uh, actually, I think it would be quite easy because uh, for the water restoration in Hong Kong, because like, um, uh, Hong Kong people are really pragmatic when it comes to using water. I, I, I as a layman, like, I just turn on the tap and then can use it so easily. So it's, it takes so long for the educational, like, I think, tens of years to change their habit. So I, what I try to suggest is because I, I know the water meters, the personal water meters is installed in all the like um, households. So it's quite practical for those people to try to say if you try to use water less compared to last month or last year or something like that to introduce a uh, like incentive system. I, I, I think that would be practical. Kind of be like um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know whether you want me to respond. We have thought about this. I mean, the prerequisite is you have to impose a heavy water tariff rate. Otherwise, still people will think that oh, it's uh, still very cheap. <laughs> okay, that's a good proposal. We'll we'll see how we can um, uh, use it at uh, in due course. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, I would like to supplement two points about Singapore. Singapore water security is not only a water security issue, it's a political security issue. Because uh, by 2062, uh, the water supply agreement from Malaysia will, uh, will expire, and the government of Singapore would like to... Uh, actually, they don't want to continue with this uh, uh, water uh, uh, supply agreement from Malaysia. They want to use 100% uh, from their own water. So they have to... Uh, uh, change the percentage of using seawater desalination uh, and also water reclamation to, to increase the percentage, and that's a quite a different situation. And secondly, when, when we say water rationing, uh, I don't know, involuntary, we have we do have some water rationing in the sense that when we have water main bursting, uh, we learn about this, then we have uh, discontinuous water supply, but only for a short duration and very limited. So. Um, I don't know whether uh, we should continue with this situation. Some people like it. Just like last year, I remember the 1st of January last year, when I was uh, just posted to uh, uh, Water Supply Department as a director. Uh, we do have uh, 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 a discontinuous water supply for the Western District of Hong Kong Island for about uh, more than eight hours. So you can see the impact on the livelihood. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yes, back there. I have a question uh, for WSD. Um, oh, may I know your name and your affiliation? Oh, um, my name is Rose from Austrian Trade Commission. Uh, I just have a question uh, on the uh, quality of Hong Kong water. Uh, because I found that if I don't use any filter, I will sense 
the strong smell of the chlorine and maybe other chemicals. I just wonder, I mean, is the quality of the water that we need that much chlorine in the, in the water? Well, this is um, a question we actually not only uh, chlorine, uh, which we have uh, been asked about the addition of flora as well. Uh, for residual chlorine, uh, actually I have tasted it myself. Because according to the World uh, Health Organization, uh, the level is very low, but in Hong Kong we are 10 times lower. Uh, if you taste the, um, uh, the, the water with the amount as uh, recommended by the WHO, you can have a strong taste and smell of the chlorine. But in ordinary households, the smell is much less. I don't know which district you are living in. Uh, it depends on the district, because if you are very near to the uh, uh, water treatment works, that means you will have the first drop of water from the treatment works, then you, will be, uh, uh, you have a, a highest uh, uh, taste of this chlorine. If you are quite a distance from the water treatment works, you will lower. But whatever, our level is still very safe, and we need it. Because if you don't have this residual chlorine, according to our study, then the water from your water tap, the quality of the water from the water tap will not be safe enough and, and that will not comply with the uh, World Health Organization. But if you uh, ask me about the actual uh, quality of water from your tap, uh, our study is that because in Hong Kong, when we uh, have clean water to the household, then the household has its own, uh, uh, what we call the inside service system. That means you have to pump your water to your water tank and then to your water tank. And the problem here in Hong Kong is, as they mentioned people, they don't have a, a good habit of cleaning the water supply system. And that is the problem we are now tackling. Uh, we hope that uh, starting from this year, we have a strong message uh, to all the uh, private uh, developers and estate managers that how, and we will see how they can frequently inspect and clean the, the inside service system in Hong Kong. And one day, uh, then the water, the quality of water from the water tap will be clean enough, as clean as those from the water treatment works. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Wang. Uh, I'm what, uh, from service department. Uh, I want to ask my, uh, because in 2015 uh, policy address, we DSD have to revise like, our water bodies. So we have to keep our water bodies clean. So I want to ask uh, Mr. Jure is uh, in Switzerland, how to make sure your water body is clean? By dry weather in the center, or by legislation catch everyone to, to glue the water bodies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, there's, uh, since, since the 90s, there's uh, the water law in force, and uh, they, they define uh, also uh, standard values for, for the uh, water quality in rivers and lakes and so. And also, uh, of course, uh, you have some obligations how to treat water, what you have to emit, or what you cannot emit to, to, to the natural resources. And uh, so if you, if you misbehave in, 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 in a certain way, you know, we have quite a lot of problems sometimes with construction sites. So the, the standards there are very, very strict and all the systems to prevent from, from such events are, are quite strict and, and the, the local authorities really try to control that. Of course there is no 100% guarantee for that, but uh, so far uh, also if, if it happens, if, if like uh, on a construction site they polluting water, it happens of course also in Switzerland and quite a lot of fish will die and then you have it in the media and then you looking for who is to blame for, uh, then they are prosecuted, of course. So I think there's a, like a controlling system installed in the last 20, 30 years, which works pretty well uh, during this time. Uh, thank you for your information. I'm Nancy Lowe from the Canadian International School of Hong Kong. Uh, I was wondering if Switzerland or Singapore has any financial incentives for consumers to conserve uh, their consumption, whether it be a, a graded system, for example, if you use over X amount, you have to pay more, or if you use under a certain amount, you have to pay less, things like that. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for these questions. Uh, I have my colleague here, he's the financial expert. <laughs> uh, I would like to have a qualified answer to that uh, and give the word to Andreas. Thank you. Uh, not really. So it's the same tariff for everybody. Just, uh, let's say, the, uh, the level of tariffing is uh, <laughs> incentivizing, I think, everybody to economize. And on the other side, for people having really low incomes, we decoupled uh, supporting those households from tariff systems. So water tariffs, electricity tariffs, it's the same for everybody, but poor households, they get social subsidies. Um, I, can I answer that one? Um, I don't know about Singapore, but actually we have progressive tariffs in China uh, on the mainland. Um, in Beijing, um, there, are tier, there are three tiers. So at the top tier, you pay about nine RMB per meter cube. And in Guangzhou, you pay about four RMB per meter cube. So how much do we pay here yeah. per meter cube? Four Hong Kong dollars, 4.5. 469 Hong Kong dollar per meter cube. Um, so, so technically, we're if you take into account, I think, currency exchange um, for a high-end water user in China, they're, they're already paying um, more for, for it than we are. So that's that's why everyone is sort of saying that we should try and increase tariffs because otherwise you can't um, encourage water savings. Has that system being considered here in Hong Kong? Aside from raising. Aside from thinking about raising the water tariff here, has the, the progressive system also been considered if the tariff is raised here? Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, we, we've already got the uh, 48 system. Uh, if you uh, use more water, like the last, the fourth tier, it would be 40% higher than the tariff rate of the third tier. Okay, the first tier we have uh, uh, free allowance, that means um, the first 20 cubic meter. Uh, of each, ho each household uh, for a uh, four month period with free of charge. But this is mainly for the hygiene and the cleaning. About that, then we have some subsidy. And then on the third tier, the tariff rate will be uh, the gross production cost of each unit of water. And the last tier, 40% more for the extra, more extra use of the uh, uh, water consumption. Yeah. Uh, I'll add in Singapore's situation, for the water-saving devices and also water-saving behavior, Singapore government does subsidize. Like they have that uh, plan to save 10 liters of water per day. That challenge the program started a few years ago and the government encourages the residents whoever sign up on the program and they have a benchmark and then the government will help to install water-saving devices free for the household. But with the commitment, they have to reach a certain target. Same as a, as a business, government has certain amount of the fund to subsidize the uh, business to swap into the water efficiency device. And other than that, about the water therapy in Singapore, they price the water at the cost of desalinate one liter of water. That's how much they charge the customer. And regardless of whatever the force, the form of the water you use, it's all uniform. And for Hong Kong, and probably a lot of people don't even know, if you are using seawater to flush, you don't have to pay. You pay nothing about getting the seawater into your household. You pay nothing to emit the dirty water into the drain. This is 80% of the population. And the seawater costs, probably WSD has the number, it's not cheap, it's not free, it's half, roughly half of the freshwater cost. If you put it into the picture, how many people would go to the toilet just for fun to flush a toilet for price? Um, I think the, do uh, the dollar cost in Singapore is 168 US dollars per, per meter cube. So, so it's quite considerably higher. WM Nam, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, formerly the Hong Kong Observatory. Um, I appreciate the effort of the government um, to explore ways uh, to maximize water resources in Hong Kong, desalination, reclaim water, and so on and so on. But for me, I think the best water resource is from the sky. So my question is for Mr. Lam. 
have we uh, made any study to maximize the catchment of water in Hong Kong? Uh, revitalize our catchment areas, perhaps building more recipes, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, we have carried out uh, studies on this. Um, there are two aspects. First uh, is about water gain ground. In Hong Kong, uh, about one third of our land is already water gain ground, catchment areas. So first of all, you have to consider whether we could expand uh, this uh, water gain area to more than one third of our land. That is one thing. Second thing is, of course, about the reservoir. We have some calculations on this. If you want to expand our reservoir capacity, there are two ways. You have to uh, uh, increase the height of the existing dams, like the public code for the uh, or, or uh, the other uh, impounding reservoirs. And we have some calculations. It means a colossal cost of call. And the other thing is, of course, you can you can build a new impounding reservoir. Then that is another business. Um, our current calculation again it boils down to the uh, value for money. Whether we can uh, uh, really uh, uh, justify. The cost, because if you fill an reservoir, you still have to expand your water, getting ground or catchment area in it in order to have more water. So um, there is a limitation or expansion of the uh, local yield, and that's why this year we switch off this uh, seawater desalination as well as the water reclamation, because uh, 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 from the very for money point of view, it will be more uh, prospective. Uh, but that said, uh, we start uh, to review the total water management. Our strategy this year we will ask the consultant to look into uh, uh, some more innovative way how we can uh, still expand our uh, water uh, water uh, local yield uh, capacity uh, from uh, uh, very for money perspective. Thank you. We've got time for these two final questions, the two ladies. Good morning, I'm Yu Xiaopeng from Deutsche Bank. I have just one question. Uh, have you calculated if the government is going to remove all the subsidy, just to reflect the total cost of water consumption as well, uh, as, well as the water treatment costs, including that seawater flushing system? How much do we need to pay for a cubic meter of water consumption? And is that uh, high enough to uh, educate people to serve more water? Thank you. Then we take all the questions in one go. So, uh, Jenna Homer, Presidential Foundation. Uh, my interest is in um, value for money uh, for water in terms of um, uh, land conservation management of the watershed. So, in New York, I think in 1996, they did a study that showed it would cost them eight billion U.S. dollars to build a new water treatment plant to service metropolitan New York, but it would cost them only 1.5 billion U.S. dollars to actually manage the land in the watershed upstream to make sure that that water was clean uh, of good quality and quantity. So I'm wondering if there are any sort of studies on the ecosystem services valuation for uh, the P PRD region um, and actually also maybe in, in Switzerland experience and in Hong Kong to look at that. Thank you. Uh, for the first question, actually uh, I just mentioned the faulty system. First tier is um, uh, free allowance, so charge. The second tier is uh, subsidized uh, production cost, and your, your question is the full production cost. That's the third tier. So back in about 1979 and 1980, when we first introduced the tier system, uh, at that time, the charge for the tier three is actually the full production cost. But since we have not uh, increased the tariff or just the tariff rate for 20 years. Uh, our current charge is about six dollars per cubic meter. Of course, it's uh, much lower than the full production cost. It will be at least uh, uh, two to three, two times uh, if you really want to calculate. So uh, still a, a long way. Uh, uh, maybe I ask uh, a little bit about the second part. Uh, for the one third uh, of our area as the water gain ground, Hong Kong generally is all right because people are quite um, uh, mindful of the. Uh, protection of the, uh, uh, the resource, water resources. So we don't have uh, much problem about contaminating the impounding municipal water. But if you want to use uh, water other than the cassette water gain ground, like uh, for example some drainage area, uh, then that would be a problem. If you want to make sure that every drop of water from the sea, uh, from, the, uh, from the sky, that means that you are talking about the storm water, the drainage, that would be uh, difficult, just like the uh, uh, the water on 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 the, on the 
roads or the urban areas, it will be quite contaminated. Uh, in Singapore, they have, uh, I, I don't know, I, I understand that they, they want to save every drop of water. That means even for the drainage water, they want to make use of it and recycle it. But in Hong Kong, uh, we, uh, we have some, we have carried out some research on this. That will be quite a lot of uh, uh, resources to clean every drop of water from the sky. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just sort of do a bit of the second question for China. I think uh, Sue mentioned earlier that you know um, we get our source from Dongjiang and everyone is worried that Dongjiang is going to get increasingly more polluted and so on. And so therefore our treatment costs will be higher. Um, we just actually published a, a, a drinking water resource uh, safety uh, report in China. Uh, it's, it was only in Chinese, but as of today, it will also be in English. And a lot of the problem is around uh, the pollution of water sources, right? Whether it's for rural areas or for cities, uh, this is an issue. And a lot of the global wastewater treatment um, plant standards, or even water treatment plant standards, can't actually let, handle the level of pollution um, there is in China. And so this is, has been a problem for uh, the Chinese officials in trying to manage safe drinking water, either for cities or also for, for rural areas. Um, China doesn't have a environmental protection law that protected it uh, to a certain level uh, that it was required until this year. So last year was enacted, this year it's going to uh, be in force. So China's just where Switzerland was in the 1990s, was it, when we had your law. Uh, the Water Prevention and Control Plan is not out yet. Uh, it's supposed to be out now. So hopefully with these two in place, uh, China from today onwards uh, will try and clean up those uh, water sources. And they, and they do consider um, new treatment uh, styles and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So also sometimes instead of building uh, big water treatment plants that's just very um, energy intensive, uh, there's also bio-react uh, uh, materials in there as well, biodigesters, blah, 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 to take care of all the bacteria and so on. Um, and also moving the plants that are closer to smaller plants, closer to cities, means less pipes and et cetera, et cetera, as well. Um, so so all, all kinds of these types of options has to be explored, uh, you know, because you have to water save, you have to increase water supply, and uh, you have to sort of use water effectively in industry um, as well as pollute less. Uh, but without doing all of that, um, our water source is going to be at risk. Uh, yes, I have two points into it. China. Um, law or rule never short, but enforcement, that's the major problem. And whether the new leadership or new initiative or even new revised law or whatever can be used as no longer a toothless tiger, still we can see. Because we all know the actual problem is not really, we don't know how to construct a good legislative framework. It is the system whether that allow you to really enforce it or not. This is the situation. I know the government of China invests a lot in the Dongjiang River Basin, often on behalf of safeguarding Hong Kong's water safety. Um, that is just a partial statement, because it's more importantly, more people living upstream also drinking the same water. You cannot doubt their determination. It is how you can actually implement <coughs> that requires not only government, but also people like us. We share the responsibility as well, as lots of the Hong Kong invested factories actually distributed along the Dongjiang Basin. And about Singapore's practice, Singapore, this is uh, how they do it. They view water, as Ms. Lam mentioned, national security issue. So in the very early stage of the state's establishment, they already put water at a very high level. In that case, they made a water plan, the master water plan, together with the other three major national plans. One is the environmental protection plan, the other is about cleanliness. So why cleanliness becomes such a priority issue in Singapore is because of they need to clean Singapore so that to in order safeguarding the water quality that people live in and also work in. And this is something holistic approach and it's an integrated management mechanism enable Singapore to push their water, water policy into one basket. 
And in Hong Kong, we probably still have our water agencies a little bit scattered around, all under Development Bureau. <laughs> so I have seen under the same bureau, your interdepartment communication sufficient and works well, but can we further integrate and make it from the resource, price, usage, treatment, close the whole circle under just one management agency? Would that improve? Sorry, so I just I, want to mention about the quality of the uh, raw water from Dongjia. Um, there are three points I want to mention. Before um, 2004, uh, the quality uh, of the raw water from mainland is really a problem. Uh, and that uh, would be an impact on our treatment, water treatment costs in Hong Kong. So that's why we raise it uh, to the mainland, and they have um, already built a uh, uh, dedicated uh, water aggregate. So the water for uh, to make the, the water for uh, uh, importation to Hong Kong, they actually either is under a tunnel or it's an elevated uh, uh, pipe so that the water is well um, protected from the contamination in the surrounding. So that's why after 2004, basically the quality of the raw water from the mainland uh, is accepted to us. So that's the first part. The second point is uh, over the years, since uh, uh, 2004, there's about 10 years, each year we will um, uh, uh, we, we will have a visit on Dongjiang uh, River to make sure that the quality uh, is acceptable to us. Uh, last November, I actually went there and uh, inspected a number of sites. Uh, we have made some uh, in, uh, improvement suggestions uh, to the authority. And uh, I can see that the, uh, the, the, the Guangdong Authority has uh, placed a very high importance on making sure that the water quality of the raw water from Dongjiang to Hong Kong is good. That's the second point. The third point is last year, uh, they have already commissioned uh, a new computer center. Uh, and the main the center is basically they have to collect uh, all the, uh, the, the water samples from uh, each and every, uh, well, for the major uh, collection points uh, over the Dongjiang River basin. That means they have all these uh, water samples and they have analysis it. Basically, they will under they will know uh, if the water quality of a particular area uh, is it, uh, not good enough, and they have to take some enforcement action. Uh, we visited the center and find it uh, easy, still at an early stage, but we can see that the intention behind uh, the whole effort is to make sure that they will improve the quality of the uh, water to be. Uh, imported to Hong Kong, and we will uh, continue the monitoring uh, tour uh, along this line. Thank you. Thanks, the panel members, for sharing your experience and your views. Water resources management, a key issue in Hong Kong, perhaps not just in 2015, but perhaps in the few years to come. And as Mr. Ma earlier in the panel this morning before the break said, mid. 2015, we are going to hear about the proposal regarding water tariff adjustment and then the, the government is reviewing the total water management strategy and it's going to be completed perhaps next year and then we have a lot to think about and we have a lot to consider and perhaps it's time for us to really think about how to raise awareness and how to change our own behaviour, start doing it perhaps, may, may not be water rationing so, so radical tonight, well, we can all think about it and see how we can contribute to water conservation, individually what we can do, and in the community what you can do, in your workplace what we can do to help conserve these valuable resources. May I now also invite all of you to give them a round of applause to thank our panel members. the organizers, the Council General of Switzerland and also EPP for supporting our event this morning. The Civil Exchange will continue our research in this area and for today we have um, colleagues capturing the essence for the dis on, on this discussion and we'll all let you know when the report is ready. And with the speakers and panel members' permission, we'll also upload their PowerPoints onto our website. My colleagues will also let you know when they are ready, up available for download, for free. Thank you very much for your participation.